You've got a problem. Change your fucking car. And I think that Russell and Wolf are correct when they say they need to start from scratch. Hello and welcome to the Undercut Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Billington. We're back to preview, 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 well, well, sanity's already gone, preview this weekend's Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. Joining me as ever are the cheese and pickle to my plowmans, Ellie Mae Taylor and Timo Albus Daly. How are you both? I'm good and oh my days, if this is how we start the podcast with you, then we're in for a fun preview. It's been a busy Monday. And I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not, not shabby, not shabby at all, really. Um, a bit tired, but yeah, I think I'm, I'm ready, to, ready to talk Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. I think I'm eager to get on with it and discuss what the hell has happened. Are we going into my big thought of the year? Yeah, I figured we should sort of probably go with the big thought of the year and then see where <laughs> at that least leads. The, at least the editing for this is going to be easy because there'll be these massive gaps between everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, anyway, hit us with your big, big thought of the year. Is this the one thought we're getting from you this year, or are there going to be others later down the line? Uh, there may be others, but this is the first of big ones that have, I've been thinking about for possibly the last week and a bit now. Oh. And it's that, say, Aston Martin are on the rise, they end up beating Mercedes. At what point do Mercedes turn around and say, we're no longer going to provide you with an engine? Find a new one. I suppose they've got to see out their contract, haven't they? Well, oh, because the contracts mean so much in Formula One, Jesse. But yeah, you can buy people out of contract, but there's going to be, there's going to, to a certain extent, there's going to be a contract to which it has to happen. But when when's that contract up? Very good Is question. it year by year? I get... No, because usually, like, you sign a few years with the engine supplier. Let's have a quick Google. Aston Why can you not tell him this yeah. stuff beforehand so he doesn't Google mid podcast, do you, mate? It's fun because then you also episode. get the, you can then get the tippy tappy noise of the keyboard. Aston Martin. This isn't an ASMR podcast. It should be. Engine yeah, it shouldn't be, not with you involved. Ellie may, maybe. I'm ruling myself out for that one straight away, but let's get you out of that straight off, Jesse. Because it, well, sort of Jesse's looking it up, it's it's kind of like the situation Red Bull is in, in that they sort of, no one wants to provide them with an engine because they're fighting against them. So if Aston Martin then becomes sort of on a similar level level as them, no one's going to want to provide an engine for I them. I kind of hope it does happen at some point, though, because it would actually make the engine manufacturers more exciting when that comes into play in 26 because at the moment we get all these names saying they're joining and we're like eh not too bothered about it it's not like it's an actual team whereas this it could be spicy then because if they really need an engine and that's where bulk of their performance is coming from then it could be it could be a fun spanner in the works but i don't think they'd do anything this year there would nothing that would come in place this year because you can't really do it. Maybe next year at the earliest would be when it could actually be implemented. But even then, by that point, it could also be a bit too late. You might as well see what you can do if you're Mercedes in terms of turnaround. And maybe that's the challenge, an extra challenge you want because you're like, yeah, okay, they beat us with their own things. And so now let's try and for 24, take it back from them and show them, yeah, that doesn't happen two years in a row or some kind of, you know what they're like. It's, but I could see it happening at the same time. Well, Mercedes have said that they're potentially looking at withdrawing their sales of power units because they're not making substantial amounts of money um, from it, essentially because they've got to provide for Aston Martin, Williams and McLaren at the moment. There's not a huge revenue from it and it's taking up a huge amount of time. So they might have to look at how they're who they're allocating engines to, which will be interesting. And Aston Martin and Williams have both spoken to other people about getting engines. I know Aston Martin at one point were in conversation with Audi when Audi were looking at joining, which they are now doing, obviously. So there's a possibility that a few years down the line, maybe 2026, Aston Martin will swap to using Audi power units. I'll put the question to both of you then. If you could, if you were obviously somehow the one with the power at Aston Martin, if you were Lawrence Stroll, who, if you take Audi out of it, which company would you want to supply your engines for you? I'd go Porsche because they were so close to getting a deal with Red Bull that they. But must Williams have Porsche planned. is a much sexier idea, no? Williams Porsche is because, of course, it you have sounds a so much nicer. Cars with Williams engines in them. Um, 
Uh, I don't know. Um, I think if I was Aston Martin, I'd be looking at probably buying in. Ooh, I think I'd definitely go down the Audi route. It might seem boring because it's the one that... I said you can't have happen. Audi. Okay, That's if I why I was avoiding this. <laughs> um, if I can't have Audi, I'm going to go to... I think I'm going to try and get Renault then. Renault Alpine engines. Interesting. Or Aston Martin start making their own. We don't know what's going on inside Lawrence's big shed. There could be room for developing an engine. As, as long as it's not by him, then. Does Lauren Stroll just sort of sat at a big table with a piece of paper and a pencil going, right, an engine. Uh... That's the reason he's got all of these really short board meetings is so he can get back into the shed and start like, I've got to figure out how to make this bloody engine. He sat there with sort of a stripped down Lego, sort of the V6 from the Lego McLaren and just sort of going, well, can we just make that bigger? That Does that work? Yeah, that was kind of my my food for thought this past week because I was sort of looking at sort of the Red Bull Ford situation and how over the years Red Bull have sort of struggled keeping an engine manufacturer and how no one really wants to supply them that are already in F1 and I thought are Aston Martin then going to have those sorts of problems if they get big? Aston yeah, Martin you... Honda? Um... Just because Honda will try and come back in another different way? <laughs> The, the, the key thing to remember, though, is Mercedes, as a road car company, Mercedes Holdings overall, owns an extortionate amount of Aston Martin, the road car company. So it's going to take a huge business shift for those two to separate. And then obviously the F1 tyres go with it. Like the new Aston Martin Vantage is little more than a gussied up SL Mercedes. So there's this huge engineering tie on the road that you're going to have to unpick and untwine. Speaking of one of the greatest Formula One teams of the modern era, um, they seem to be a bit of a split team as well at the moment. And with Hamilton saying that the team didn't listen to him enough and Russell and Wolf saying that they need to uh, start from scratch. And then they posted some absolutely bitch made apology on, to fans on social media, apologizing for the fact that they didn't do well enough. And I've got to say, the social media for them this the year has been a bit off. It's They've changed a few things around. I'm not a big fan of it, to be perfectly yeah. honest about it. It's, it looks a bit... It just looks a bit naff. Something about it, their media presentation does It was a lot better really... last year and the year before, but this year just... I don't know. Something just seems off. It is all slightly weird. And to write off a whole season just after one race where you didn't do that badly, and it's also that case of without going too deep, it's life. We all go through ups and downs. <laughs> like... Oh, she went there straight away. <laughs> so, yeah. Mercedes... Spin-off podcast were never... on Mondays. <laughs> Mercedes were never always going to be at the top. They, You're always going to have sort of, not necessarily a fall, but you are at some point going to have a more bit of a More of a trip fall. in this instance. It, f- it feels like more of a trip and to give up like you say on it it does seem a bit you can see why especially because of Aston Martin and a few of the other teams not making quite as much progress obviously because they're not as much further up but you can see progress being made but to write it off seems a bit silly as well but then now what is saying if they'd listen to me a bit more maybe we'd be further ahead and it just seems to be all a bit I don't know it's very I can understand odd. why you'd have this waiver of the Mercedes it's very on Mercedes. I can understand we'd have this waiver of confidence, that, but they've they've tried essentially this car last year. They have an entire seasons with the data for essentially this style of car aerodynamically. It doesn't work. They know this now after a season. They know that under testing and under a race weekend conditions, that the changes they've made to said car do not work. Not Certainly not to the extent they want it to. So they know that essentially what they've done is narrowed down the things they can change on this car until they've been left with what's clearly the side pods. It's the only thing that's so radically different from everything else. And that seems to be the only thing that they've now got left to change, which is such a key structural and aerodynamically integral part of the car that when, you, when they say start from scratch, 
doesn't mean they're going back to putting a giant straight eight engine in the front and a driver in the back with a prop shaft running between his legs. They're not going back to a 1950s racing car, but they are going to have to go back to the drawing boards and think of a different way to aerodynamically engineer and cool the car. Because that's a key part of what happens with the side pods is not only do they start as the top end of the skirts that create the downforce, you've obviously got all the internals, the cooling systems running through there. It's a key element to try and get right for both cooling for reliability purposes, but also because the way you're funneling the aerodynamics out the back of those, what you're doing with the different pressures of hot and cold air running through them and how they exit the rear of the car and what either wake or downforce they're able to provide running through a diffuser. It's, it's such an integral and central piece of the car that you can't just simply swap it because you need to get that air funneled into it with the right front wing, with the right suspension blades. Then you also need to get that taken out the correct way with the correct rear diffuser, with the correct rear brake drums and housings and with the correct rear wing. There's so many things that if you change that middle element, it totals your entire design. And that's why they're going to have to go for this clean sheet design. Hamilton seems to believe that there is a possibility to extract something more from this car and potentially through all of the different iterations he tried last year. He was their test bunny last year. He tried so many different front wing and setup changes and different elements across the season. He's clearly found a, a small inkling of something in it that works, but potentially it's in those smaller elements as opposed to the side pod based design. They might be able to transpose those weird things they tried with to try and make the side pods work to a new car with a more conventional side pod design they might work there but the key thing is that the current overall design of that mercedes does not work and i think that russell and wolf are correct when they say they need to start from scratch but to go back to the media thing and the presentation thing mercedes it feels like it's sort of stumbled and it's struggling to try and find its feet again because everything about it seems to be sort of last minute a bit jostled a bit sort of thrown together and when you look at the way that they presented things and even down to things like the really simple things like their media graphics last year they were really clean they were really functional and did a really good job of portraying exactly what you need to know whether it was on instagram facebook twitter and so on and so forth it was clean functional really nice exactly what you'd expect of the team this year it just seems to be a little off and i think it's all perfectly encapsulated in that weird jesus t pose george russell does in the opening credits because that is almost certainly not something that the drivers would have chosen themselves that is something that would have been given no. some level of artistic direction by the intro director and a certain extent by the team because the team wants the drivers to portray not only themselves but also the team and their confidence about the sport which is weird that Charles Leclerc already looks dead inside in his little is that weird though is that weird not Charles Leclerc looking dead inside <laughs> but George Russell's weird Jesus T pose maybe which almost maybe feels to more just of go a Hamilton on... thing on it your things so there, maybe that's cool, but building up the courage to say, look, guys, I'm going Aston Martin. Yeah, just sort of going, right, I've got something to say. Fellas, crikey, this is big news. Um, but to, and- to go back on a couple of the bits you're saying, though, like, yeah, the, especially the media side of things, I don't know what's going on there. I don't know if they hired a new person and they're trying new stuff out or if it's just another big misstep there, but it doesn't it doesn't attract kind of I don't know I don't know if that's working on new fans because I'm not a new fan for them but it's as someone who's been a fan of this for a while it's not I'm just looking at it like, mm, no thank you um as for the car surely you would maybe if you're still a little bit undecided as you clearly are in the team at least with the three main people involved being Lewis George and Toto and what to to do about it would you not develop this car as it is until say the summer br- not just say until the summer break just to try out and just make sure that okay we definitely definitely have got it wrong and then at least you just then you kind of do what Alpha and Hess and whatever else did last year and we just don't bother developing it at all over the summer we just go straight on to the next thing and then by that point you've also seen what all the other teams have done in terms of development and what you can try and predict what they're going to do because you just do what Aston Martin did last year like okay we like this this and this stick that on a new car jobs are good on and try again next year. I'll let Ellie May say her piece. Thanks. My worry is if they say we need to scrap sort of, well, it's mainly their aerodynamics. How much of that are they going to scrap? And is it going to be a case of this is not the worst of Mercedes yet? Because if you look at what McLaren did in the winter, they realised they've gone down the wrong route and have restarted and now they're at the bottom of the grid. Does that mean if Mercedes stop developing what they've got, are they going to fall back whilst they're trying to develop a new concept? 
Okay, so I'm saying you do it halfway in between, and then you kind of get the least worst of both. Mercedes knows what works and what doesn't work on this car, and what doesn't work is the side pods. They've they've exhausted every other route. So basically, what they've said is clearly what we need to do is just sit out this season and wait. With McLaren, they're at the back of the field because they had an electrical issue and a software issue with Piastri's car, which is not something necessarily to do with their redesign. The other problem they had with Lando was simply a hydraulic leak. And that's, again, nothing to do with the overall design of their vehicle. That's just a fault that's fluke and the worst possible time to happen. They're not necessarily going to be at the bottom of the field when they get the car reliably running. And again, I think that's going to give them hope as to what they've been able to produce over winter. Bahrain then we find was out that not... they've got a driver issue. Then we find out they've got a driver issue. One of them doesn't come with the car. There'll be a different problem because McLaren and Zach Brown's going to say, oh, we've got a different problem. But the fact of the matter is Bahrain is nowhere near representative of McLaren's ability on track in a race weekend. Through testing, And the same was the same with better. Mercedes last year. It was not representative of what Mercedes could do and they were winning a race by the end of the year and arguably could have had a couple of other ones under their belt. They could have, but the problem is that while Mercedes have tried to work on a full old concept, everyone else. Oh yeah, has no, I'm agreeing with you there. I'm just saying for on. McLaren, that should be something reassuring for them because it's but, like, yeah, yeah, you can work at this absolute pig of a car and get it up there. And McLaren have got the right path aerodynamically with their side pod design, their structure. It's not too far afield from the things that we've seen working with the Alpines, the um, Aston Martins, the Williams, the Ferraris, the Red Bulls. It's relatively down the correct lines of what you need to do to produce a, a viable chassis. And it just needs appropriate fine tuning. And whether or not McLaren have the ability, the funds, the skill set back at McLaren HQ and working to do that is a different question. With Mercedes, it comes down to this the key element of the fact that that car will not become a good race car. No matter what you do with it throughout the season, you're never going to find anything that truly works or is overall beneficial to that car's performance because it is working around a flawed central item. That's why they've said that their, their best strategy for 2024 is to start working on 2024 now. Through what little development they've already done for 2023 at the car as the season progresses, if they find something that does work a little bit and go, okay, we can tweak that as we go along, but basically set everything for 2024. Because equally, 2024 is going to be the first year of chassis that are impacted by the cost cap breaches for Aston Martin and Red Bull. All of a sudden, you're likely to see those two teams brought backwards. If Mercedes can spend as much of this year as possible moving forwards, we're hopefully going to see a big clash as those two come back together. Because this year, Red Bull would have had their design fully submitted, basically, and gone, yeah, that works, halfway through last year. That was before they even got hit with the cost cap regulations. The same with Aston Martin. They would have had their 2023 car designed basically two weeks after the summer break last year. 2024 is when we're going to see those cost cap regulations hit teams that broke them. And equally, that's when Mercedes are essentially going to have to give themselves an entire year to develop that car. And I know that's a separate point that could be made for another time, but I do think there needs to be some way of having um, any cost cap penalties implemented sooner than not even the year after, because it does seem weird to have that delay. I mean, I, I know that's probably trickier to do in practice than it is in theory, but and I don't have the solution, but it's just frustrating that you've got to wait essentially a whole season um, before you can see some kind of... Because we, before we even know if that was harsh enough of a penalty. I mean, again, going to debate about what well, deserves what in any way in the beginning but that's a whole other thing um, yeah we'll find out whether it was strict enough in 2024 but the fact of the matter is that's when it's being impacted if you're sat at Mercedes mm. with a blank piece of paper and someone sent you a text going start working on 2024 now you're immediately going to be targeting straight back at Red Bull at Aston Martin at Ferrari because two of those teams are going to be hit by wind tunnel testing time and cost restrictions and they're going to be hampered by it. Red Bull have got a winning formula, but they're going to need to find a way of advancing that on one season. And they're cut back by a huge amount of wind tunnel time. And equally, if you're Mercedes... Watch how all of this still doesn't help Ferrari next year. It might not help Ferrari, but if you're Mercedes and you have a bad year this year, what you're doing is you're earning yourself more wind tunnel time for developing that 2024 car as that year develops. If you Mercedes and you come into 2024, roughly third fastest in the field in Bahrain, but you've got a trick up your sleeve because you finished fifth the season before, you've got a huge amount of wind tunnel time. You've got one of the best development teams on the planet. You've got a proven unit of people, of designers, of engineers that can create like year after year after year, world record setting, championship winning cars. And you've now got more wind tunnel time than you've ever had before. 
the bounds of what Mercedes can possibly do as 2024, not necessarily starts, but as it develops from race three, four onwards in 2024, we're going to see a new beast unleashed from Mercedes. It just sucks that we're going to have to sit through and watch what should be a very good team with two absolutely world-class drivers struggle for a season. But the end game of that, it's you just got to be patient, I think, is, is the key point. I feel like Ellie and May can probably make peace with sitting through that for a season, though. Well, no. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> she said I I'm convinced. Say, but I agree with what you're saying, Jesse, in the sense that they, if they are going to scrap... But what they've got, they need to do it very early on this season. Because as well, when you go into, as it next season, the cost cap gets lowered again. So that is less money to try and experiment on different designs and trying to get the right one to then become a championship winning car again. So yeah, if they are going to do it, they are going to have to do it now so that they give themselves enough time, enough money, enough wind tunnel opportunity yeah. To end up sort of getting back up again, but yeah, I think if they're going to do that, they're just they're going to have to suck it up that they are going to get worse this season, and this is not the lowest point. Yeah, to the average viewer, they're going to get worse because other teams are going to develop around them, and Mercedes will have perhaps two development packages lined up. After that, it's going to look like that their car's going backwards through the field, but it's the whole idea of when you're skydiving, if you pull your chute, you don't rush upwards. Everything else just rushes away from you downwards far at a greater speed than you're moving it's the whole idea of even through, you're confusing which, yourself there jesse the whole idea is it's it's from which point you view things whether you're stood on the station watching a train go past whether you're on the train watching the station go past it's that it's simply a case of where you're looking at something from but essentially it's going to look terrible for mercedes but they yeah like anime said they need to pull the trigger sooner rather than later to give themselves the most time and crucially the most money it is a cost gap era the cost gap is getting tighter if you've got a year where you've got more money than you will next year you want to spend all that money making sure that you're shored up for the year coming then obviously next year they'll have prize money coming into that which will help them buoy you back through if they've got a good enough car which hugely relies on them doing things correctly this year We'll move on from talking about Mercedes quite so intensely to Red Bull. And Horner confirms that talks between Red Bull and McLaren for supplying engines in 2026. And that's a long way off. We should probably wait until 2026 to talk about that. But no, it's important because Red Bull and McLaren for supplying engines in 2026. So does that mean McLaren are going to have Ford engines? Are they going to they going to have Red Bull Ford derived engines going in the back of it? Is this a key thing that Mercedes really is going to be shutting down, selling out as many engines as possible to dedicate that much time and money. Or no, Mercedes is going to stop producing that many engines to try and look inwards and focus on itself a bit more. So McLaren have had to start looking elsewhere. And they've thought best people to go to are going to be someone who's clearly proven they can build championship winning engines and is bringing in the entire engineering might of the United States to do so. It's a smart move, I think. We'll have to see if it pays off. I don't know if anyone has got any thoughts on McLaren going back to Ford engines. I think that it's it's a weird one, the McLaren at the moment, because obviously it's a little way away, so they're trying to be prepared, but then they're in a, such a mess at the moment that I'm not sure if they're just trying to do too much in one go instead of they're just spreading themselves a bit too thin over everything, whereas they're just forgetting to actually do anything about their current situation. But... That's just that's just a feeling I get. It just seems like they're they're juggling a lot of balls and forgetting that they don't need to be doing quite that much. I don't think this ball that with regards to their powertrains for twenty twenty six onwards is in quite the same sort of realm or being juggled by the same people that are trying to make the brakes work and make sure there's no, no. enough hydraulic fluid in Lando's car. It's that you've got to have a certain aspect of your team looking forward at what's coming next. Otherwise, it's always going to come as a surprise. And that's where you see F1 teams falter and disappear from the roster. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it makes sense. I just think from an optics point of view, it looks like they're just so all over the place with so many things, not just in Formula 1 at the moment, but with, with everything else, that it just kind of seems like the one thing that they're not fully focused on is actually current Formula 1 and getting that car up to, up to scratch, which might be totally wrong with that, but that's just how it comes across a lot of the time at the moment. I wouldn't say it's a lack of focus. I'd say it's it could the best way it could or the worst way it could more realistically be viewed is a lack of care about what they're doing for this season and possibly seasons to come until they essentially shore themselves up again. Bear in mind how much of a flux and a slump McLaren's been in since about 2012. 
they've not really had a decent time of things since then. They've had the odd podium hither and thither, but they've been a I think every time they build up team. to where it looks like they're going to make that jump up, they then falter again. Mm, because they've sort of had this plan of getting better, but they've not figured out what to do next, and then they just fall off the cliff again, and then have to start looking forwards again. So it's this this weird idea of you've got to keep looking forwards and having that plan for, okay, that's great, what next? And I think this is positive in the fact that McLaren are looking at going elsewhere. They've had Mercedes power units for a few seasons now. They had Renault right when just as Lando Norris joins. They've had them for at least three seasons, I think, on the top of my head. So they've got to start looking elsewhere. And again, if Mercedes are looking at changing how they're doing business, you don't want that to come as a surprise to you. You don't want to be in the Red Bull Renault situation where all of a sudden Renault goes, ha, screw you, we're not going to give you engines anymore. And all of a sudden Red Bull's going, shit, um, who have we got a phone number for? Honda? That's not a situation you want to be in, especially if you're McLaren trying to build up something big when you've got Lando Norris on a contract till the end of 2025. You've just spent Maybe. how many millions of pounds buying Oscar Piastri? You want to at least prove that's gone somewhere. So you've at least got to, and equally to the drivers, you've got to say, look, we've got a plan. Otherwise, those drivers are not going to stick around. It's pretty much a God-given fact at this point in time. Lando Norris is not sticking around at McLaren. But you've got Oscar Piastri there. You're going to want to try and at least get some of your money back out of the poor guy. So you're going to have to give him a plan that's going to convince him and also Mark Webber that he should be sticking around. It's you've got it. it you, there has to be this long term plan, and I think McLaren needs to make it. The optics of them making it when they're floundering at the back of the field with a car that's got two iPads glued to the wings and a steering wheel that doesn't work isn't great. But there's no better time than the present to start sorting out your future. Yeah, I think engines is almost the least of their worries, but a Ford McLaren relationship we've had that before. It won the 1966 Le Mans, so... <laughs> yep. If that's what been... they're basing it on, they're really getting desperate with their reasons, though. <laughs> this worked in 1966. That, that, yeah, we'll take that. Against Ferrari. Yeah, but look at Ferrari these days. That's not much of a competition, is it? <laughs> not particularly huge competition. I mean, when, did Mac- have McLaren, when did McLaren last run Ford engines in F1? That's the real question. Bear with while I Google it. I should think it would have last been when they ran something like the Cosworth DFV into the 80s. Mm. Yeah. Um, 1983, uh, when you had Lauder and Watson running the three litre Cosworth DFV. And again, that was a pretty successful car with podiums and points all the way through. Only saw the team come fifth because I think 1983. I'm going to take that if they can get them on the podium some points, though. Hmm. Again, if it's pod- they were getting wins and podiums with it. And by that point, the DFV was a hugely outclassed engine. It was nowhere in relation to, I think that year was PK that won the championship. And he was in a BMW engine Brabham that produced the best part of a thousand horsepower. The DFV was struggling to push 750. So you've got a car with a further 33% horsepower that's winning the championship, but you're still taking wins and podiums against it. McLaren Ford is a pretty decent pairing by that history sort of aspect. I agree. Don't get me started on the very fun intricacies of how BMW was able to cram a thousand horsepower through that tiny BMW. Don't worry, we won't. It was. It's really cool. I might pick your brain on that in a out of this podcast. I'll be doing a lecture after this. Anyway, our third point from the news is um, also based on engine suppliers and funnily enough also to do with Mercedes supplying engines. This is James Vowles saying Williams will decide on power unit suppliers this year for 2026 and onwards. So it's the same situation McLaren's in but you feel a lot more confident about Williams doing it although it seems every time Williams choose a power unit supplier it never goes particularly well. Or always seems to have problems, or never perfectly worked well, for them for the first the few fact years. That they're choosing it for twenty six now instead of waiting a couple of years or so should be a good sign because it, depending on who you're choosing, say for argument's sake it's Porsche, you can start doing all the kind of donkey work now and trying to figure out a bunch of stuff that definitely shouldn't work, so you can not make those mistakes later. It seems again, it's weird that Williams is more reassuring than McLaren on this one, given where they are, but you kind of have more trust in them and Mm. I don't know, it's just that feeling you get from them that you don't get from McLaren. I I can't really describe it. 
I think a key thing Williams have learned is when they started taking the Mercedes hybrid V6s, what Mercedes do is they split the turbocharger down the length of the engine. You have your impeller at one end and your exhaust propeller at the other, and then it runs a shaft through the V6. Williams didn't know that's how the engine was laid out, so had to completely reorganize the turbocharger and the exhaust and the inlet manifolds when they went to fit it in their car because they didn't build a car but had that space in it so hopefully if williams start picking someone now that gives them essentially three years or 22 23 24 25 yeah three years to sit down with their engine creator and go right where are you putting this where are you putting that how are we going to have to package this what aerodynamic packages are we going to have to look at creating as opposed to when mercedes literally drove a lorry up to their sort of workshop dumped a load of stuff and went there you go there's your engines they go well that doesn't fit they're gonna go make it fit then you're williams you should be able to engineer this you make fridges technically and then left and mercedes and williams were just left with having to alter what was a very good power unit but hamper the way it was it ran because they didn't know how it was going to be delivered and if they can sort that out ahead of time it's promising and the fact that they've taken that mistake they've made previously and learned from it is what you want to see from Formula One teams. If I went into the history books with Ford McLaren, then I'm giving Williams a Renault engine. <laughs> I'm on board with that as well, to be honest. Tag V six is for a point, which wasn't that bad either. So that's true, yeah. Perhaps get my watch back on a different manufacturer of Formula One cars. Um, anyway, that's all we've got for the news this week. That is what the hell has happened in the past week or so. It's um, nearly as long as our whole review episode of the Bahrain Grand Prix. <laughs> that, that, weirdly, there's been a lot to talk about. Um, we'll move on to looking ahead at the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. And the first question we always ask is, what weather can we expect? And I've simply written in the notes for this warm and dry at Saudi Arabia. It's going to be little else. Um, yeah, I haven't actually looked at any numbers or data yet. We are still about five days out because it is Monday. But... Is there a sprinkling chance of a missile strike or is that not on the cards this year? Ooh, I don't want to hedge my bets. Um, it seems kind of quiet over there, but every time you say that when you're working in a pub, all of a sudden it gets busy. So as soon as I suppose you're standing in Saudi Arabia and goes, huh, it's quiet, there's no missile strikes. Another Probably... reason we shouldn't go to that Grand Prix will tempt fate too much. <laughs> Yeah, probably shouldn't be allowed to that one. Anyway, um, which on-track battles should we look out for? This is one of my favourite questions to try and decipher last season when we did our predictions. And this year, well, this early on at least, it's it's tricky to call with accuracy. But I'd expect the Red Bulls to look strong again. And optimistically, from a fan's perspective, we'll have a good battle between the Ferraris, the Aston Martins and the Mercedes. Ideally, Alpine will be a lot more in it this weekend, providing a tackling block possibly for the Alfa Romeos as well. Haas could be in for a decent performance if they can both nail qualifying and don't go too bold on the strategy. We've seen that the car has decent one lap pace. If it can get its drivers able to extract that from the car in qualifying, it's a tricky circuit to overtake at Saudi Arabia. If they can do that without fluffing a strategy, without going something strange too early on, they might get away with a few points. Uh, Williams, again, I reckon could be on for points. It's that same principle of just qualify well and run the race to your own pace. That seems to work for Williams, not have to worry about fighting too much else. Just focus on getting that car through its 300 miles as fast as possible. Don't worry about what those around you are doing. So um, capitalise on the fact that Saudi Arabia being Saudi Arabia and DNFs left, right and centre very possible, as long as they can just avoid all that carnage as well. Like you say, just run your own race and avoid all the trouble, then should be okay. It does pay off nicely and it could work for Williams. Alpha Tower and McLaren still have a lot to prove though and I think we've yet to see the full potential of either of their chassis chassis um, this season. Just so, on their durability and some of the corners here depending on how that goes. Again, yeah, you're going to be looking at not necessarily somewhat to an extent durability whether we're cracking wishbones and things but equally to a certain extent ride compliancy and how much that disturbs the underfloor aero. That's going to be a big thing because we've got huge curbs and you're hitting them one side after the other if you're really breaking up the airflow underneath, it's going to be a real question of which teams have got the best essentially ceiling around was the edges. Was it uh, Color Science last year in the Ferrari that did that just about save of coming off one of the corners early on in the lap? I'm trying to think. Uh, I think it, it was like, like he was he really rode the curb and then was just he, like, was he big just managed it. to save it. It was turn it was that turn one two three bit. It was where Mick crashed last year. It I think. ran really wide on the exit of I think turn three. 
and just managed to hold it together mm. essentially as the car sort of resettled and regripped. But yeah, if you pin yourself off the curbs too much, you're you're risking losing time. Ellie, mate, you look they like you're lining have, up for a point. I, they have changed the curbing at turn three. So... They put spikes they, in it. Yeah, a, they call it a rumble line, which then essentially means it makes the car shake, but it slows it down. Mm. And hopefully it then should sort of maybe keep a bit more control. Um, I'd say I guess the most important part is getting turn, I guess, 27 correct to make sure you've got full power then to turn down the straight to turn one, because that really is your only overtaking opportunity. Mm. I mean, you've got a DRS into that final turn as well, because that's where we saw Charles yeah. and Max dueling with it, as they had done in Bahrain last year, where you sort of dummy one person into going for it, so you've got the DRS for the second one. And yeah, like you said, getting a good exit out of that final turn is key to getting a lot of lap time out of the car, which Max knows the boundaries of because 2021, he overstepped those boundaries and ruined what could have been the all-time greatest qualifying lap from a driver. Miles ahead, about half a second up the road from Lewis, time-wise, and then just taps the wall and breaks the wrist suspension. Grosjean-esque. Um, very Grosjean-esque, but that was a qualifying lap, which leads us on to the interesting question of who do we think is going to qualify in pole position? Sergio Perez for me. Did it last year. Loves his street circuits. Bang tidy, why not? Ellie May? Max Verstappen. It's going to give us the quality we haven't seen from him on this circuit. Yeah. Yeah, this third time lucky, I guess. Yeah. Well, now she's said it. <laughs> now she's jinxed him, which means that it's actually going to be my guess Fernando Alonso getting pole. I reckon it will really put the cat among the pigeons and it'll just be absolutely fantastic to see. He's going to cruise past Max on the line yeah. window soon, just stick his hand out the car. Way. <laughs> it would be a real test to see how quick that Mercedes engine really is because obviously this track is almost like what 75% full throttle. Yeah, you it's just sort just... of wibble around at full throttle. Yeah, it's foot down. Break a little bit at maybe turn one, two, maybe, I don't know, like four. And then you go flat out until about turn 10. I honestly don't know. It's such a weird circuit. I've not bothered learning the layout. I'm surprised for it. anybody doesn't know more of the track, considering how much time she's been spending on the graphic for it, getting the corners just right. Should be imprinted on the inside of her eyelids by now. I know, and I have literally written half a track guide from turns 1 to 13. And I'm just trying to remember <laughs> which ones are the breaking. The, the biggest breaking zones are turn, turn sort of going into turn 1, 2, a little bit at 3. You keep going, basically then a little bit of breaking at 4. Then I guess it's like full throttle then until like turn 10. Mm. And then it's... So that's you the semi-banked one, isn't it? And then turn 13 is the semi-banked, which then it's sort of that case of braking and turning at the same time. And mm. then the rest of it is basically full throttle until turn 21, which is like a like more of an S than a chicane. It's not quite sort of that strict in its turning. Um, and then, yeah, and then it's like full throttle again, basically to turn 27. It's a pretty harem scarum lap. How many laps are we doing of it? 57, is it? 50, I think. 50. So after those 50 or so laps, who do we think is making up the podium? And I think, oh, it's easy. Well, we, can rub, we can rub out who's winning the race. We've all predicted the same damn thing. We're all predicting a Verstappen <laughs> win. Um, so who do we think is coming second? It's the same as last week anyway for me. I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to try a thing out because of, I'm predicting it's going to be a dullish year for, for motorsport for Formula 1. So... I'm going to say that this weekend's podium is going to be the same as the last one. And then, and then you're just going to copy paste that out. Saudi Arabia. Yes, and we'll see what happens. You really I did wonder like whether you were copying and pasting <laughs> what I had predicted. I'm doing a Mercedes. I'm testing stuff out for next year. <laughs> see what works. Um, I've gone for a Charles Leclerc second and Sergio Perez third. Which you know is... it's bad when I think that's more ambitious than Jesse's second place. It is bold i mean it's bold but it does match her wild prediction later on yes it does i mean i've gone for fernando alonso second charles leclerc third which i feel is weirdly realistic 
Where's Checo for you? I I don't know. I I just, if Charles Leclerc is able to keep <laughs> yeah, his to car be fair, running, Red Bull second enough, driver. Yeah, they'll have to. They'll sort of use Perez to try and hold off Alonso from taking Max's win, and that's how Charles will get through. I just I thought, who has the with Alonso getting in second power... anyway? So it really doesn't work. I just thought, who has the more powerful engines? It's probably Red Bull and Ferrari if they can get their reliability in tow. Okay, so if you think it's if you think it's down to most powerful engines, why have you put Esteban Ocon as your fastest lap holder? Because Alpine were very good in their sh- in long yeah, fast penalties. breaks last year. Yes. And this is only the second race of the season. So you thought, ah, hell with it. We'll give it a shot and see if it's. I am kind of basing it on last year's, uh, how they were sort of very good in the speed traps. I think it should, if it's like last year's car, this, as long as the engine does not blow up with the power it's got to use. There she said it. Then. I think it should be a good race car. And Pierre Gasly almost got fastest lap last race, so... I should say Pierre Gasly, then. No, because I think it'll be Ocon. Ocon's got some... He's got some uh, points to make up for, so... Yeah. On his licence or in the in the race, in the championship? We, we don't talk about the amount of points that the Alpine drivers have. That's dangerous, <laughs> dangerous territory for both of them in reality. Timo, um, your fastest lap, please. I'm going to stick with this all season till it happens. George Russell. Nice. And I've gone for Fernando Alonso. I reckon that essentially Max will be so far up the road, as soon as Alonso's cleared the defence of Sergio Perez, he'll have essentially a free circuit to absolutely smash out a couple of fast ones as he traces him down in the final few laps. That's how it's going to pan out. That's where it's going to come from. Calling it now. There's worse logics. There are worse logics, usually employed by me as well, which is weird. Um, wild predictions. Timo and I have gone down a similar route. Ellie May, you've gone yeah, for you're, the wildest you're, prediction You're copying of me a little bit there by thinking, if he can do that, then I can maybe get in a shoehorn with this. <laughs> mine is similar but different, but Ellie May has gone... I wrote me. mine first. <laughs> you did write yours first. I will. That is correct. Ellie May, though, yours is truly wild. Yes. Well, I thought you two had been a bit negative. So I thought... <laughs> The wild predictions need a positive spin. Hopefully no spins, though, because Ferrari are going to have a good race. And for the third time, she has now said that. <laughs> you uh, really like jinxing things, don't you? Well, my predictions last week were very good. This is so true. So in theory, I should be emitting positive energy out into this world. And, you know, if you manifest it... Ferrari's a bit of a challenge happens. for someone even with your powers, though, huh? I think well, she can pull it off. Okay, so Timo, explain to me your only 10 cars finish the race, and then I'll explain my, my reason for going slightly different, but very much the same. I'm not sure really what I've got to explain there. 10 cars finish the race. The other 10 do not. Okay, so I've gone for only Name five... The <laughs> no. <laughs> I've gone for only five teams have both cars finish, which means that we could actually just have we 15 could both be cars. Right. We could both be right, but I could also have 15 cars finish the race. F- those other five are just individual drivers from one team, and then you've got five teams where both drivers finish. And I've got a bit more scope for flexibility in mind. I'd much it rather soft. it was mine, as it purely is, with yours fitting into that, and then somehow Ellie May gets the Ferrari thing as well involved. It's not improbable <laughs> that all three happen at the same time. But there is also a risk that I reason. prefer it all to be uniform rather than wishy-washy. I think that would be more fun because mm. the odds of that are just astronomical. Yeah, just two by two by two by two, like they're sort of coming through the checkered flag like Noah's Ark. Mm. Side by side and everything. That would be nice. But equally, mine opens up the possibility of it. If more than five teams finish both cars, I don't get the point. If less than five teams... 
because I've got I've got a greater greater level of specificity. I think I could have one of every team finish and be fine, and you'd be screwed. Exactly. So there's there's still this. We might have picked essentially the same prediction, but there are different outcomes for the two of us. It's that going would... back to your train analogy from earlier. It all makes sense now. Exactly. There is a nice circularity to what I say, which brings us nicely to the conclusion of this week's podcast. Unless we want to chuck in any feeder series guff, because we might have F two, don't we? Surgery, but going to be nuts. End of. Fair enough. I think it's going to be pretty, pretty damn crazy. And Teo Porcher has got his work cut out, but I reckon Zane Maloney's going to do something mad. Um, that is all we have time for on this week's episode. Join us again soon when we'll be reviewing the Bahrain Grand Prix and the feeder series. Hey. <laughs> the, oh, we haven't changed the notes, have we? Um, the, I was thinking you'd notice before because I, I only did just not. saw that now, but you I, did not. <laughs> I, I fully anchor man my way into that one. You put it on a screen in front of me, I'm reading that out. Um, that's all we have I'm time I'm going to change for. the end of it bit then as well because it also says we have an interview on the horizon with Alex Brundle What's I've, I, I'd read that far ahead by this okay. point I, I, I tripped up once I wasn't going to simply go back and trip over the exact same thing <laughs> um, that's all we have time for on this week's episode join us again when we'll be reviewing the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix and the feeder series action from across the weekend we also have an exclusive interview with Alex Brundle on the channels right now i say on the channels it's on a few clips are on our socials and the full interview is on our youtube channel so make sure you've liked subscribed and got notifications turned on to not miss anything and while you're there give that interview a watch it's pretty damn good fun where ellie may and i sat down with him after the london classic car show to chat all things nascar historic racing and food sort of ish lots of food it, they're easy quick fire questions timo where can the people find you me yeah, you. That's what I said. I said Timo. I cut out slightly. That's all. Well, I can be found over on Is It First on the Curbs, the Nitro X Podcast, Paddock Sorority, Paddock Passion, and Instagram. Lovely jubbly. Ellie May, where can the people find you? You can find me co running the Instagram page and running our TikTok. Where can we find you, Jesse? You can find me on Instagram and Twitter as at Jesse on Cars, as well as writing for Classic Car Weekly. And like I've already mentioned, you can also find... No, I haven't mentioned it already. Actually, you can find the podcast on Twitter where we moan about things. I say we, it's mostly me moaning about things that are largely motorsport related. So yeah, plenty of things there for you to find out and keep yourselves entertained with until the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix this weekend. Mm -hmm.